Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Cindy Wyman. Cindy was born and raised in rural Minnesota on a large farm. She has a degree in accounting, but animals have always been an important part of her life. When she had experienced a few too many Minnesota winters, she decided to move to a warmer climate in Georgia. After working as a veterinary assistant for 10 years, she decided to apply for the animal control officer position with the city of Madison when the ACO decided to transfer to the police department. Her career in animal care and control began with Madison in 1999. Madison is a small town of only 4,000 residents. It was easy to make positive changes. She was also allowed and encouraged to attend training. She completed her National Animal Care and Control Association certification in 2002. And that very same year, she was elected to the Georgia Animal Care and Control Association Board of Directors. In 2005, she was elected as Secretary Treasurer of GACA, a position she held until March 2016 when she was elected president. In 2011, she was appointed to the NACA Board of Directors and elected as treasurer in 2012, a position she still holds. Her involvement with TNR began in 2009 when the CAT complaint issues reached close to 80% of the call volume. Partnering with Altered Feral State, the City of Madison approved TNR. After a change in the local ordinance, TNR began. In the first year, over 200 cats were sterilized, vaccinated, and returned. She has been a foster for dogs mostly for over 25 years for the Humane Society of Morgan County, Ockney Regional Humane Society, and Southeastern Newfoundland Rescue. She is happily married with a stepson, his wife, and four beautiful grandchildren. Cindy, welcome to the show. Thank you. You have had a long, long history working with animals, and it sounds like you got started primarily with community cats back in 2009. Can you explain a little bit about what it was like having the call volume being close to 80%? Without having any real resources for the people of Madison, it was very difficult. At that time, either the cats just stayed where they were, unvaccinated and unsterilized, or they were trapped and, for the most part, euthanized just due to the fact that TNR had not been approved and that there was very few low-cost spay-neuter options for people at that point. How did you find out about TNR back in 2009? One of the district or the state representative for the Humane Society of the United States had a little get-together where she invited animal control, rescue groups, spay-neuter groups, It was just a little brainstorming and get together to encourage everybody to work together. And that's where I met Carolee McKay with Altered Feral State. We immediately hit it off. She understood the problem in Madison. And we began working together so that I would have a good presentation to give to my boss on how we could incorporate trap, neuter, vaccinate, return into the city of Madison. Once I gave the research and what I thought would be in the best interest for Madison, my boss actually 100% agreed and gave allowed me to start looking into ordinances. Ordinances at that time would not have allowed for the city to participate in TNR. Once I got all the research and found ordinances and that would work with our ordinance. It went before the mayor and council where it was approved. They also gave a budget, which is kind of groundbreaking in Georgia. It was the city of Madison approved the first 100% government operated and funded trap neuter project in the state of Georgia. Wow, that's fantastic. And did that project proceed beyond that first 200 cats? What has happened since 2009? Even though I'm no longer working there, the trap, neuter, vaccinate return 
still is a budgeted item. There's a budget for the sterilization and a separate budget for trapping supplies. And the new animal control officer who I stay in contact with is also doing trap, neuter, vaccinate, return. So it's it's been an ongoing project, and I don't think anybody sees an end to it. It's been very successful. And I would assume the call volume has gone down, or actually the type of calls may be different um, over time, too. Overall, the call volume has gone down, but there are still spikes when, you know, like kitten season where there may actually be more calls, but it's a different type of call now. Now it will be somebody saw one cat or two cats. It's not the calls where somebody wants 25 cats removed. It's just a, you know, a single cat, maybe one or two, but not multiple. It's the early on abandoned situation, which is extremely unfortunate that we do have to deal with cats that are abandoned. And I wish we could solve that issue, but it's great to be able to have animal control involved in a very proactive program in helping community cats. So that's just fantastic news. Kudos to the city of Madison for doing that. One of the greatest benefits when I would talk to people about it is, of course, in Georgia, we've got multiple venomous snakes. And a lot of people were very, very fearful of them. And when I would explain to them that if the cats kept the rodent problem under control, that it actually would reduce the number of venomous snakes. And so people that weren't even excited about cats or didn't even really like cats started seeing the benefits of TNR. And so actually that was my way into some of the communities that you would traditionally think wouldn't be interested in TNR. Cindy, you bring up a really interesting point there in talking about your messaging for advocacy or or messaging in order to get folks to do what you want them to do. So my reason for supporting community cat programs might be different than my neighbors. And as an animal control officer, it's sort of important for you to be able to figure out what's going to motivate you to be able to do, you know, the humane solution. I've actually spoke at several conferences. I have a short PowerPoint that I give, and it's community cats, why do they exist, how to manage them, and conflict resolution. And the biggest part of dealing with community cats is understanding why they are there to start with. It's not always just an abandonment case, although that can happen. So many times when I'd go to places where there are multiple cats, I'd see multiple bird feeders. And whenever you put out bird feeders, you are attracting rodents and, of course, birds, which then attracts cats. A lot of people just randomly kill snakes because they think they're evil. And then you are destroying the rodents' natural predators. Additionally, we put our garbage behind our houses in garbage cans, which attracts rodents. But in most of our communities, we won't live with any rabies vectors such as fox, coyotes, raccoons, who would, again, possibly keep the rodent population under control. So by having the community cats, we actually are controlling our rodent population where we have, for the most part, removed all the rodents' natural predators. One of my favorite sayings is, where there is a predator animal, there will be a prey. It's our choice of which one we choose to have around. I actually, I happen to live up here in Vermont, so one of our concerns is bears. You were talking about the bird feeders and and the trash and all that stuff, and you do. You have to be very careful about how you handle the chain of life because if you disrupt it, then the balances will get way out of whack. That is correct. And, you know, in almost all cases, when you look where there is a group of cats, there is a reason that they even showed up at the first person's house who started feeding them. They require food and shelter. When you have those two items... Cats will gather, and if somebody truly is insistent on not having cats, a lot of times you have to change the environment. Otherwise, you're just going to have new ones move in. If if the situation that brought the cats there to start with hasn't been changed, you're just going to wind up with new ones. And, And that's one of the things where I would talk to people if they were going to continue to feed birds or collect aluminum cans in their garage it would be much better to have vaccinated and sterilized feral cats 
the new cats that were not sterilized and were not vaccinated. And now let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors. Accidental Exiles by Bruce Perry. Jesse McAllister, a young Texan and a rock war vet, escapes to Europe where he seeks a new direction and to heal his desert wounds. Wandering the streets of Ascona, Switzerland, he meets and falls in love with a beautiful Italian waitress named Sonia Altarelli. Since the horrors of combat he encountered with a boyhood friend, Jesse will have nothing more to do with war. This story is his farewell to arms. Check out Accidental Exiles on Amazon.com today. Community Cats podcast founder Stacy LeBaron doesn't just talk the talk, she walks the walk. Stacy is available to provide customized consulting for your group to help you increase your effectiveness and develop an action plan for improving the lives of cats in your community. Working with you, Stacy will develop a consulting plan that meets your needs, including visioning workshops for your staff, board, or volunteers. For more information, you can contact Stacy directly. Email Stacy at communitycatspodcast.com or visit our website and click on the education menu. Let's join forces to make the world a better place for community cats. So I would like to turn the tide a little bit. And you had mentioned that you had done some public speaking with a PowerPoint presentation. And I understand you are the treasurer for the NACA Board of Directors. And I'm wondering if you could expand a bit on NACA, what it is, and what their thoughts are around community cats. NACA is the National Animal Care and Control Association. We are a nonprofit that is dedicated to training and support for animal control officers. We do have a certification course for you know, a very extensive education course for animal control officers. For years before I was involved, NACA pretty much had the old adage of feral cats should not exist or community cats weren't even really addressed. Several years ago, they took a position that TNR is another tool in the toolbox for feral cat and community cat control. One of the biggest breakthroughs in my mind was about two and a half years ago, doctors Kate Hurley and Julie Levy called a meeting at the ASPCA headquarters for people from all the large national animal welfare groups trying to roll out their new initiative for community cats. As I like to call it, I was the only animal control officer there. I was NACA's representative. And I was very, very well received during that whole meeting because the reality is TNR depends on animal control involvement or at least acknowledgement and information that only animal control would likely have because we're the ones that are going to be getting the complaints for the neighbor's cats. Through that think tank, the Million Cat Challenge was born. It was a suggestion where instead of making it a negative about not euthanizing cats, that it was actually challenged to have a much higher live release rate and a goal. NACA actually was one of the initial supporting organizations for the Million Cat Challenge, which was, in a lot of people's opinion, a very huge breakthrough that we actually would support managed intake, trap, neuter, vaccinate, return, capacity for care, all the initiatives outlined in the Million Cat Challenge. And I, I was grateful for the opportunity to meet with all those wonderful people where I could really express animal controls concerns and where sometimes our limits may come in, not necessarily because we personally believe something or didn't agree with it, but where our government agencies that we worked for didn't either have the ordinances or the manpower financing to do what in our hearts we thought would be best. And so through that process of helping develop the Million Cat Challenge, that was really sort of the initiator that sparked NACA's desire to pretty much come out publicly in support of TNR programs? Yes. Before that, it was considered another possible tool, but after that, it became something that we would truly get behind and support. Looking at today's situation with community cats, what you see locally and across the country as you travel around and go to lots of conferences and other places and talk with people from all around the country, 
What does the future of community cats look like for the animal control profession, as well as just the whole community cat population across the country in general look like to you? I think it's changing for the betterment of community cats. As there's more education, more people in animal control and the government agencies are starting to see that there is no way that we could just eliminate outdoor cats, that that is not a possibility. So the best thing we can do is to ensure that those that are here are vaccinated and sterilized. Additionally, with the more education on how they become part of the natural environment as far as rodent control. I've used the adage many times of imagine an area with a high number of feral cats or community cats and think about putting a fence around it and if you could just magically go poof, all the cats are gone. Within two months' time, we would be overrun with rodents and I think everybody is aware that rodents have a lot more serious diseases Yes, cats can carry rabies, but mice carry the plague, hantavirus, listeria, many, many, many very, very bad diseases, and that the cats actually are helping to control some of those diseases. So overall, I believe that the whole outlook toward the community cats is starting to soften into realizing that they truly provide us a benefit. The working cat model. Yes, So if you were part of a small TNR group or a new group in a community and wanted to work to engage the local animal control officer, how would you suggest these two parties learn to work together? There's a couple very important parts. And as a nonprofit group, you are normally going to be dependent on donations and or have the possibility of getting grants where understanding that most government agencies, there are a few grants that are open for government, but for the most part, most of the agencies that fund TNR only will fund nonprofits. When it comes down to working with government, money talks. Even the animal control officers, if they want to participate in something, it is all budget dependent. And if their powers up the ladder have not allowed for a budget, it cannot happen. So what I tell groups initially is for nonprofits, find out how much it would cost, how much the nonprofit could help, and then show numbers. In order to get government involved, you've got to basically show them how it can save them money, not cost them money. I was extremely lucky that the city of Madison would actually fund trap, neuter, vaccinate, return, but most government agencies would not fund it. If you can show how you can work together and actually save the government, the county or city money, that will be your foot in the door. Great idea. If you saw a stray cat on the street, what would you do? It truly depends what street, what's around, there's a way, a lot of variables. If it was in a residential area and the cat seemed friendly and healthy, I would presume that it probably had a home and I would leave it there. If I was in a business area and it looked really lost or was sick or injured, I would either take it to a vet, animal control, or and Now, this would be me as a citizen, of course, not as animal control, because my duties there would be totally separate. But you really need to look at the entire picture. A healthy cat in a healthy neighborhood is probably going home. In another situation where the cat could be in danger, you know, busy road, you would want to handle that differently as far as, you know, getting it to a safe place. And even, you know, the same sometimes holds true for trap, neuter, vaccinate, return as far as even there may be some cases where you would not want to return a cat to where it came from if it did not appear that it really lived there and it was a very busy area or a place where a a building was going to be demolished or something like that. There's many different ways to handle it, but either as a regular citizen If there were several cats in an area, I might talk to the person, you know, see if I could find out where they were feeding them 
and see if that person would be interested in TNR. And you actually touched upon this. You mentioned that you have had some experience with doing a barn relocation program or some knowledge about doing that. In the case where, say, there's a a building being torn down and the cats cannot go back to that location, you would be supportive of a barn relocation program. Yes, um, either to a barn cat program or in some cases, if you've got experienced people, you can relocate them into a, another colony. There's many different requirements for, you know, the different types of colonies or whatever. But yes, barn cat program is something that where I'm at now in Gwinnett County has been very successful in finding new homes for cats that are not suitable as household pets but for whatever reason, cannot go back to where they came from. And there's other buildings being demolished. And also, I know in Madison, a couple of times I would have feral cats that would show up at the nursing home. State regulations wouldn't allow it. Mm. So they could not go back there. Mm. They had to be removed, but moving them out to a barn would be a happy place. Well, that's unfortunate. Nursing home sounds like a good place for a feral cat colony, but that's unfortunate that there's a situation. I, over the years, have dealt with several colonies at nursing homes in Massachusetts, and they've had quite a few successful colonies out in the back. It it, it is what it is. In this case, the case the state came in and said the cats had to go. The challenges that we face on a daily basis being in this business So, Cindy, I was wondering if uh, people are interested in finding out more about you or NACA, how could they find you? You can look on the NACA website. You can just do a search on the National Animal Care and Control Association. The website is www.nacanet.org, or I can be emailed at cwyman at nacanet.org. And Cindy, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Overall, the most important part, not only for community cats, but for animal welfare in general, is for everybody to work together. Sadly, one of the things I see far too often is rescues or nonprofits and animal control fighting, disagreeing, and sometimes even the volunteers, where instead of really trying to bring everybody together. They spend too much time tearing each other apart. Collaboration will always benefit the animals, but fighting amongst each other really does not do any good. So the most important part of any of this is working together, understanding that in order to benefit the community cats and animals in general, that a collaborative, polite effort from all of us will go so much farther than fighting. I couldn't agree with you more. That is a great way to sum up our conversation. And I think that if we want to advance our efforts with community cats, we have to have our animal control officers involved in that solution because they are on the front lines. They are the leaders in the solution. So we need to make them a part of our efforts and definitely work collaboratively together with them. Cindy, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today, and I hope that you're willing to be on the show again in the future. Certainly. I would love to. Thank you for listening to Community Cats Podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes and leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 